I'm pleased to present the number one selling book in America, free to choose. It's number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and I ought to know. And it is written by uh, the Nobel laureate, a man who uh, will never be con uh, accused of making economics confusing. A man who has a reputation for uh, not only saying what he thinks, but writing what he thinks as well, as he has done in this most important book titled Free to Choose. Please welcome the Nobel laureate in economics, Milton Friedman. Right here. <laughs> comes again, uh, Milton Friedman, and uh, boy, does he make an entrance now, because uh, this is a blockbuster book, uh, Free to Choose, uh, which, uh, not surprisingly, features a very uh, uh, attractive, flattering, uh, professorial picture of our guest on the front. We uh, feminists can only wonder what would, uh, we can only wonder how they would respond to this the fact that uh, the book is co-authored by uh, Professor Friedman's wife, Rose, and to what uh, location do you suppose she has been relegated? Uh, You've got that wrong. Don't you know that the best always comes last? Uh, okay. Uh, we <laughs> All right, let's, let's go over this now. And you have to admit that she's prettier. Uh, you, you certainly do have to admit that. It's not difficult to admit that at all. As a matter of fact, that you, uh, you do seem to have it all. Uh, Professor Friedman, if you just take a personal mo aside here for some... You're, you're well married. You're married for what? 41 years. 41 years to the same woman. Same huh? woman, of course. Uh, we you, met down here at the University of Chicago and my first graduate course in economics. She was a student? <laughs> she was a student, too. We were fellow students. Oh, I see. Uh, so you never did presume to teach her, then? Oh, no, no, no. We <laughs> okay. were. This is when I was uh, first started. That's probably why you've been married 41 years. <laughs> uh, and you also enjoy the prestige of the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, you are the counselor to presidents uh, and to uh, presidential candidates. It's really a wonderful spot to be. And, and this is... You know, this is the last thing your mother would expect my son, the economist, to have become, a celebrity. You are absolutely right. Unfortunately, she died many years ago. But you know, I want to put one salt note in that. People often fail to distinguish between giving advice and having it taken. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're... Well, I've so given advice to many presidential aspirants. It hasn't always been taken. Uh, <laughs> In yeah. fact, most of the time, it hasn't been. I think we can assume that uh, it's certainly not being taken now. Well, I haven't given any advice to President Carter. But none has been solicited, I think. None has been solicited. But that, that really doesn't matter, because I publish my views in, the new, in Newsweek and other areas. Anybody who wants to know my opinions or my views has them readily available. Nobody has to call me on the telephone to find out. Yeah. The uh, only time I talked to President Carter was in the interim between his inauguration, his election and his inauguration, when there was an absolutely hilarious incident. He tried to call me to congratulate me on the Nobel Award, and he told his uh, secretary to get Milton Friedman. Well, it so happened there was a speechwriter in Jerry Ford's White House called Milton Friedman. <laughs> this is in the interim after Jerry Ford has been uh, mm -hmm. turned out. And all of a sudden, the telephone rings, and Milton Friedman in the White House hears 
President-elect Carter is on the phone, and he thinks Santa Claus is coming. Sure, he's going to. This will be the unprecedented act of being asked to come on another right. administration. Well, wow. it turned out he was really trying to get me, and he finally got me up in Vermont, where we were at the time. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me see if I can express uh, in very imprecise terms and very briefly uh, what has the, the, the core of your uh, statement here, a personal statement. We have too much government. We are not allowing the free enterprise system to work as your, uh, as your uh, most favored historical figure, Adam Smith, suggested it would work if we just let things alone. We have too much government intervention. It is interrupting the, uh, not only uh, the wonderful work that the invisible hand does if we leave it alone, but it's also depriving people of personal liberties. Absolutely. Okay. That's a very fill in, good summary. Fill in the blanks for no, me. No, no, that's a very good summary. <clears throat> there is a very important role for government to play. But there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. And government has been growing beyond bounds. Right now, to take the simplest measure, the government spending at federal, state, and local levels amounts to over 40% of the income of the people of the country. If you go around and ask people, are you getting your money's worth for that 40% of your income, which is being spent on your behalf, supposedly, by government? There are very few people who will say yes. And they are right. We're not getting our money's worth. Much of it is, it's not merely that it's being wasted. It's that it's being wasted in a very particular sense. You're spending money to do opposite things. Here at one place, you're spending, uh, we're spending our money to try to propagandize us not to smoke. In another place, we're spending our money to subsidize. to subsidize a growing of tobacco. Now, what sense does it uh, make to spend <coughs> two streams of money like that? And you can go over and over again and find exactly the same thing. The government is too big. It's too intrusive. It restricts what we can do. It's becoming our master instead of our servant, and we've got to react against it and cut it down to size. All right, let's share with the people at home just one of the statements of uh, <clears throat> Adam Smith that you refer to in your book, which, of course, when I want it, I'm not going to be able to... Uh, oh, it's on page two. All right, thank you. All right, I've excerpted from your book, as you have, from Adam Smith, so we can both, uh, we both with apologies to Adam Smith, to whom, uh, from whom permission was not granted for this, but here is what... Uh, Phil's Here's pretty good, but he doesn't communicate with the next world. All right. <laughs> By pursuing his own interest, uh, that is to say, his meaning the person engaged in free enterprise, the person who functions within the capitalist free enterprise system, Adam Smith says, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectively than when he really intends to promote it. I have, Smith says, I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good, meaning spare me from the do-gooders. Spare me from the people who intend to do good. Smith is saying if you seek, if you honestly seek your own self-interest within the free enterprise system, society will be the beneficiary. That's, right. That's a hard thing to... But take the last part of that. I've never Let's known see that much, again, Ronnie. I've never known much good done. No, I, you know, I don't have to see it. I've never known much good done by those who affected to trade for... Affected. Note he doesn't say did trade, affected to trade for the public good. Now that word affected is a very important point because you must realize that people don't always express their real interests or their real values. They say what they think will be attractive to the public at large. Let me give you a very simple example right now. General Motors, one of our major corporations, has come out against the deregulation of the trucking industry. The trucking industry today is grossly overregulated. It never should have been regulated at all. We never should have had it brought it under the Interstate Commerce Commission. It was brought under the Interstate Commerce Commission not to protect the consumer, but to protect the railroads at the time from the competition of trucks when they were first introduced into the 20s. Right now, there's a move underway to deregulate trucking the way airlines have been deregulated. There is nobody doubts that the deregulation of airlines was a very good thing for everybody. The deregulation of trucking would be an equally good thing. There are literally billions of dollars being wasted because of the monopoly in trucking. You're talking about fees uh, when you talk about deregulation. I assume you would still have some monitor on weight. And can the trucking industry benefit by using highways that I am paying for and may not uh, be using the merchandise? They that don't now. You now have a gasoline tax, which covers the costs of the highways. 
it is appropriate to charge for the use of the highways, of course. They ought not to get a subsidy. I am opposed to subsidies, and I'm opposed to the opposite of excess taxes. But they do now pay for the use of the highway through the, uh, uh, through the gasoline tax, and they should continue to do so. As to weight limits, that really has nothing to do with the ICC. That has to sure. do with the capacity of different roads. I want to understand you, though, standard. that you're not, you're not such a purist as to be impractical. You, think, you don't think anybody's truck should drive over anybody's pavement if the construction isn't prepared to accept the no, weight. No, no, of course not. Okay. Uh, perfectly. Right. That's, uh, but that applies not only to trucks. It applies to private cars. It applies to a, it. to a private recreational vehicle. But what you ought to do is to allow anybody who wants to go into the business of trucking to do so. You know, there are people today who receive $100,000 a year to give somebody else permission to use their ICC right to carry trucks, uh, to carry freight from one point to another, people who make a very good living without owning a single truck, the total value of these special permits which have been given to trucking uh, enterprises to carry freight mm -hmm. amounts literally to billions of dollars. Now, General Motors and the trucking industry, when they come down to uh, Washington and say we ought to continue regulation. Do they say we ought to continue regulation in order to promote our interests? Mm -mm. What do they say? They say the public will be hurt. They are affecting the trade for the public good. But do you think they're kidding themselves? They're saying we, we don't want the wonderful individual people in middle America to be hurt. And, and you're saying that's not what they're... It's, they know they're not stupid. They're not Santa Claus. They're not Santa Claus. They and, and are people who are promoting their own interest, and they're affecting the trade for the public good because that's the way to get things done. Nobody ever goes up to Congress and says, look, vote me a big bonanza of $100,000 because I'm a good man and I deserve $100,000 out of the public purse. No. He says you should subsidize X, Y, and Z because the poor middle-class Americans or the poor people in the slums will be, be, will be benefited from it. Mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. So you have two classes of people the so-called do-gooders. You have the honest, sincere people, and they invariably end up being the front men for private interests they would never knowingly support. That's part of that. What's an example state. of that? An example of that are the 19th century Ralph Naders who got the Interstate Commerce Commission established. They got the Interstate Commerce Commission established supposedly to protect the, 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 the consumer. No, no. They, the do-gooder reformers are Ralph Nader type were sincere. They were interested in promoting the interests of the consumers. And they were complaining that the railroads were monopolies and they were charging too high freight rates and we had to get the government in in order to, uh, to eliminate that exploitation of the consumer. But who benefited from it? The ICC was set up, the do-gooder, well-meaning reformers went on to their next reform and the railroads took over the ICC. And they use the ICC to keep out competition, to raise rates rather than lower them. They used it in the 1920s mm -hmm. to get the control of ICC extended to trucking because that was the most dangerous source of competition. So those well-meaning reformers, not because they were bad people, but they ended up being the front men for special interests. And you have that over and over again. All right. All right. I know you've heard these. Incidentally, I should point yes, out that this Adam little Smith picture tie on here is Adam Smith. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Look, uh, the only frustrating part of a dialogue with you is, it, is, it, is I, I want the audience has a lot of questions for you, too, and it's so hard to do this within the confines of this limited time frame. However... How do you, how do you and, I, and I know you've answered these questions so you can hear your teeth crack, but how do you prevent monopoly? You've got to have constraints on monopoly. Okay. And isn't United Airlines too big? And look what happened when they went on strike. And should Pan Am absorb National Airlines, we're going to have three airlines when it's all over, and we're all going to be beholden to them. They're, everybody's going to be impersonal. You can see it now on the airlines. It, Nobody it, looks it, you in the it, eye anymore. Look at, look and they're giving paper cups in first class. <laughs> How's that for elitism? But, uh, well, you... personally, I don't see any objection to paper cups. <laughs> but let's go back. The problem with the kind of statement you're, you're making is to distinguish what's true from what's not true. The plain fact is that the main restriction on the number of airlines has been the Civil Aeronautics Board. From the time the Civil Aeronautics Board took over control of the airlines in the 1930s until now, until 
the deregulation, they did not authorize a single new trunk line. Because the number of trunk lines was less. Because they were owned by the airlines who didn't want more competition? Of course. Now, so the government became then an agency to help the existing airlines not to have exactly, to compete. Exactly, exactly. Now, what happened with deregulation? You, you filled every seat in the airplane. And you had new airlines come in. The number of airlines has gone up, not down. It is true that there are some proposals to merge United and National. But there are also and Pan Am and National, I'm sorry. But there are also a bunch of new airlines that are coming out. Here's World Airways, whom you never heard of before, that's offering these cheap fares. Look at Freddie Laker. Freddie Laker broke the transatlantic uh, uh, monopoly. So the fact is that the best protection of the consumer, the best offense against monopoly, it, let me put it another way. There's an old saying, if you want to catch a thief, you set a thief to catch him. If you want to catch a businessman monopoly, you set another businessman to break it down. You don't send a government civil servant after him. The most effective anti-monopoly legislation you could possibly have would be free trade. Okay. Now answer this practical question, Professor Friedman. <laughs> and, and, and there are some angry people who would say, come down from your academic tower and tell us how we're going to get automobile dealers who really care about servicing the car as much as they care about selling us the car. Uh, tell us how we're going to get automobile dealers <laughs> who, uh, who, who sell us uh, safety with the same vigor that they sell us cosmetics. Well, if the public at large really wanted to buy safety rather than cosmetics, it would be in the self-interest of the automobile dealers to sell them safety. You have had some automobile companies that is, have concentrated on selling safety, and they have not done very well in the sales. You can't blame. Here you have, let me to give you a very simple example. You have the so-called Superba car, which is built by the checker company mm -hmm. that produces checker uh, cabs. cabs. They emphasize safety. It's the safest car probably there is built in America. They haven't been able to sell very many. If the, the problem with your, your talk is that you're not talking in terms of what the consumer really wants as judged by what he's willing to pay for. You're talking in terms of what you think he ought to want. I am also talking... Okay, so the underpinning here, under, underneath your statement here is... The stupid public want land no, no. cops and no, colors and they no, buy, they put blue lights on these cars in the showrooms and everybody says, yeah, I want one of those, I'm not like Pavlov's dog. I'm not going to call them stupid. The public is entitled to buy what it wants to buy. Who am I to say whether those tastes are better or no, worse I mean, than my taste? What's your Who conclusion on a person who's more interested in uh, the, the style of a car than whether or not the baby's protected after the collision? Well, That's stupid. I think he has every right to pursue his own objectives and his own tastes, and I have every right to try to persuade him he's wrong. Okay. But if I can't persuade him, do I have the right to force him? Now, you don't bring in the baby, because that raises another and an extraneous and very difficult issue, because I, I will agree with you, he does not have the right. To put a baby to like an egg baby. in a crate. And That's right. That's a different question. A third party effect is different. I trust you wouldn't pass a law to oblige babies to be constrained in cars. No, I probably would not. But I think that You're I would... You're not very comfortable in saying no to the no, question. No, 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 I'm comfortable. But what I would do is I would say that any parent who... Uh, any ch parent ought to be subject to suit and to being sent to jail if uh, a child has been damaged because of that parent's... Right. Are you willing to pay for the prosecutor that it's going to take to develop the evidence that the mother didn't place the, car pro the baby properly in the car and the bureaucracy that will accompany the enforcement of the law, which uh, yes, says that you can yes, go to jail if you un don't. Unfortunately, okay, I have so to pay for it. I'm not, as I say, so there are limits I'm not to an your anarchist. Freezes, I'm not an anarchist. Okay. I believe that government has a very important role, but it's a limited role. Okay. And because we've been trying to extend the role, we haven't been doing what government ought to do as well as it does, as it should. Mm -hmm. We've been doing a terrible job on what ought to be the first function of government. The first function of government is to protect the nation against foreign enemies and to protect individual citizens against assault by their fellow citizens. And we've been doing a terrible job on both ends. And, and in, that, uh, in that goal, you are, uh, you are aligned with John Stuart Mill. Absolutely. Not bad company, and I want to show you what I've taken out of your book. You've quoted Mill. Good, I'm glad to see you've read to page I've three. I've tried my... Uh, two! <laughs> two!
Page two, Doc. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, he's tough. This is a long hour, I'll tell you. Um, okay, here it is, John Str The sole end for which mankind are warranted. This looks grammatically incorrect, but stay with us. Individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self protection. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Uh, and then, oh, okay. He's the sorry. only part of the conduct of anyone, or, I'm sorry, his own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. In other words, let's understand that. For my own good, for my own good, the government cannot pass what would, what would be called uh, forcible action. In other words, in other words here's, a, here's the way... I can, a, youth, a person ought to be able to kill themselves. Yeah. The right to commit suicide is a natural human right. It's your, it's your life. It's your life. Now, uh, and you I, don't want the government to spend any money to prevent you from doing that. Absolutely no. Now, I am in obviously, I as a friend of yours will try to prevent you. If you were a friend of mine and you suddenly got to a bridge and were going to jump over, I would certainly rush over and grab you and pull you up. But you don't want public and money I to would, keep me from doing well, it. Well, I would go farther. No, no, I want to go farther on a personal basis. I would reason with you. I would argue with you. But let's suppose after I had reasoned with you, after I had argued with you, I had failed to persuade you. Do I have the right to use force to prevent you from disposing of your own life? The I clearest think you case do. of that, I, think you I do. certainly do not. I certainly do not, and uh, you do not, hmm. and certainly you do not have the right to put your hands in the pockets of other people in order to prevent somebody from doing something in his own value system. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing. Every time you bring up issues like this, people don't recognize what's been happening. Where is the rate of suicide highest? Is it in the countries that are free enterprise countries, or is it in socialist countries? Sweden has the highest rate of suicide of any of the Western countries. The last time I looked at the figures, maybe they've changed. Why? In, I don't mean why, but it, it's an interesting thing, interesting observation, well. that Sweden is one of the most government-controlled, government controlled, uh, 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 socialist countries in the world. Yeah, but, but that hasn't prevented people from committing suicide. Yeah, but, but the problem but look, with take your, the simpler cases. Don't take the... Let's this point has to be made. The problem with your point is that, that this is hardly anymore the best representative example of what the free enterprise system ought to be. So you yourself are America's severest critic. You think we've blown Adam Smith's theory here in America. So we should have people jumping off bridges left and right here. Not we because do. it's a bad... Huh? We do. Well, we but, do. Look but at that the number of people. the point you just made. No, no, it doesn't, because we have become so socialist. Look at the pr extent to which people oh, are, I see. I see. are opting right. out of the world by going it. in for drugs, by going in for various other activities of this kind, which are a delayed form of committing suicide. Yes. One of the problems of our society is that by having all responsibility assigned to the government, we have removed the pressure on individuals to be responsible for themselves, to feel that they have. A, a set of values that they are entitled to pursue. So that, no, no, I don't believe there's... I that. assume, then, that if somebody wants to smoke marijuana, that's their business, that's too. That's his business, absolutely. Uh, are we going to take that to heroin and addiction? Absolutely. Now, there, let me go back on that one, because that's a very interesting thing. Even if on ethical principles you believe it is right to prevent somebody else from smoking heroin, as a matter of expediency, it's a terrible mistake. The largest so is jumping off the bridge. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean it's a terrible mistake for society to, to render heroin illegal because that oh. increases the harm which heroin does. Why do we have so much crime in the inner cities and in the cities? Over 50% of it is attributed to crime uh, for the sake of acquiring money to buy heroin. Because Why is heroin is. so expensive? Because it's illegal. We went through this with prohibition. Whether you believe it's right or wrong, to prevent people from drinking alcohol. We had the experience with prohibition in which we found that it did more harm than good. And a lot of guys got shot in the garage. A lot of guys got shot and the, the uh, more important, the basic respect for law was eroded. Law-abiding people who would never ordinarily have broken the law broke the law in order to get a drink. Because they knew that the, that the law enforcement agencies could not possibly enforce 
with any efficiency the laws against uh, the law, uh, the prohibition law. But the reason they couldn't enforce it was because it wasn't publicly backed. If the 90% of the public had been in favor of the prohibition law, you could have enforced it. But I'm promising you 90% of the public right now is in favor of uh, enforcing prohibition against heroin. And you cannot enforce it. I agree. I was understating my case. Even with 90% of the people, you can't enforce it. And it does vastly more harm today because it is illegal than it would do if it were legal. Let me point out for a moment that more lives are lost each year through drinking alcohol than through heroin. But uh, one if there's a case, if you're going to make the case for pre preventing heroin on the basis of saving lives, there's a much stronger case for prohibition of alcohol. Uh, but th there would be some who would argue that to, uh, to relax law enforcement or to take away law enforcement pressure on heroin trade is to ensure that heroin deaths will meet and exceed alcohol deaths. On the contrary, it would reduce the number of heroin <coughs> deaths. Why would it reduce the number of heroin deaths? In the first place, many of the deaths comes, come from impure or Alternate adulterated uh, heroin or uh, needles that are contaminated. In the second place, as we found in Prohibition, the fact of Prohibition encouraged alcoholism rather than the opposite. To the young people in particular, it became an adventure to go out and get drunk, mm -hmm. to go to a speakeasy. Today, with heroin illegal, it pays a heroin pusher to create an addict. Because, given that it's illegal, if he, it's worth his while to spend some money on getting somebody else hooked. Because once hooked, he has a captive audience. Mm -hmm. If heroin were readily available <laughs> everywhere, it wouldn't pay anybody to create an addict. Because the f addict could then go anywhere to buy it. <coughs> you have had experience <coughs> with this. Britain has had legalized, not heroin in general, but they have had an arrangement under which certified addicts can get heroin from uh, 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 physicians on prescription. I assume. And it's done very much less harm than our system has. So I have no apologies for believing that far less harm would be done to this country by legalizing heroin than is now being done by trying to enforce heroin uh, prohibition. I assume, like the baby in the car, you would uh, support legislation prohibiting the sale of heroin and other addictive uh, substances to uh, juveniles. Well, that's a very hard question. I think it is a, there is a different case for juveniles. But whether you could really handle the question, that's a question of expediency, not a principle. If I thought I could enforce it, I would be willing to say that for juveniles. But I'm not sure I could enforce it, and I'm not sure when I looked into it, I wouldn't decide I did more harm than good even there. You'll agree that this is the issue that lays bare. I the whole so. notion of your personal statement, and this is where we get to the practical realities of sweat and blood, everyday life with parental anxiety. Where are my kids? What are those sirens? Who's selling what to whom? What are they doing in the car? Who's sniffing, smoking, drinking? What is happening out there? And for all of the adulation that you've received, standing ovations everywhere you go, this is a very difficult platform for you to uh, I don't speak believe from. so I don't believe so because I believe it corresponds to the real understanding and interests and beliefs oh, okay. of the vast majority of the American people I think okay. uh, that you have to distinguish between the attitudes of the public at large and the attitudes of a relatively okay. small group of people who have been trying to persuade the public to have different views I, I know that dr. Friedman and uh, look at prohibition <laughs> Yeah, I, I am. It didn't work. Okay, it didn't and work. And why did you get it adopted in the first place? If the people in this audience who are predominantly female will pardon me, it was only adopted because the young males were away in France during World War I, and, and the women of the country voted in prohibition. <laughs> Now, that's neither good nor bad. It's a st pure statement of historical fact. Yeah. The irony, though, let's not, let's not miss the irony here. The irony is that you are the darling of the conservative, or, the, uh, of almost, is there anybody left who doesn't think we have too much government? And you are as eloquent a spokesman against that abuse as there is walking around today. You are also on record as supporting the candidacy of uh, Ronald Reagan. Yes, indeed. Do I have to tell you what happens to Ronald Reagan's candidacy if he so much as breeds agreement to the statements you've just made about drugs? Well, fortunately, one of the great virtues of being a college professor is that you can say exactly what you believe and what you mean. I'm not running for office. I've never run for office. I have no desire to run for office. And so 
I, I regard it as a great luxury that I can be irresponsible. <laughs> we'll be back to this one. I just don't believe that you can take away laws. I have children. If I don't tell them what to do and how to raise them, uh, they won't know what we expect of them. I feel there's nothing against you telling your kids what no, to do. No, but I mean, you, you compare the government to that, telling us what to do and deregulation and everything. I think we have to have something to go by. Well, but you see, what you're expressing is precisely the paternalistic view of government that I object to. I don't believe government is, is, is the mother of children. I don't believe government is a father of children. I believe government is a way in which you and I and our fellow citizens achieve certain things jointly that we can't achieve separately. And I believe it is your responsibility as a mother to bring up your children in accordance with the values you believe. And I believe it's a cop-out for you to say, I want the government to do that for me. No, but there's something. You were, you were talking about suicides and how if you had a friend who was going to commit yeah. suicide, people who commit suicide are very lonely people. Of they course. usually don't have people to turn to. Right. So if you can help them with counseling, which the government would fund, that would save a life, which is very dear. It, there are different ways to achieve that. Most counseling groups for suicides, in fact, are not financed by government money. First of all, the government doesn't have any money. The only people have money. The government only gets money by putting its hand in your pocket and taking it out. And if, you believe, if you believe in the desirability of a counseling agency to counsel suicides, more power to you. Get together with friends, organize it, finance it on your own. And if the government didn't take as much money out of your pockets as it does, you'd be better able to do it. It's and, you, a very and, and also there'd be fewer lonely people and less suicide. That's How right. How am I doing, all right? Absolutely. I'm a slow learner, you're, but I'm coming you're, along. You're right. getting See? there, Phil. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, ma'am. You want to stand, please? We're in Chicago with uh, Professor Milton Friedman. Yes. Oh, if, since you do like Ronald Reagan, and let's say he wins the election and he chooses you as his chief economic advisor, what would you do to uh, restore our economy back on the right track. And would you put us on a gold standard, or could you put us on a gold standard? Well, you've asked three questions, and I'll try to answer all three of them. Number one, I have been offered the chairmanship of the Council of Economic Advisors in the past, and I have refused it, and I guarantee you I would refuse it again. Because you feel that it's what? That you have something essential? essential? I believe that I personally can be more useful outside the government than I can inside. It's a very important job. There are many able people who can do the job. I don't believe that's the way I can use my abilities and my interests most effectively. I want to remain irresponsible. <laughs> they, uh, you see what I mean by that. If you're in that kind of a position, it's right and proper that you're part of a team. And if the team decides on something you don't agree with, you either go along with it or you quit. Well, I would rather stay on the outside where I can express my own views, and I believe I'm more effective in that way than I personally would be inside the government. So I have no doubts about that. But number two, let me answer your second two questions. What measures should the government take to try to uh, Im restore economic health to the United States? And I have very little doubt about what the major measures there. But let me say first, you're not going to do it overnight. We've gotten into our present pickle because of three decades of mismanagement of the economy. And we're not going to get out of it in six months. But what you have to do is, number one, you have to move to cut down government spending, to hold down the rate of growth of government spending in dollars and to cut it in terms of purchasing power. Number two, you have to have a restrained monetary policy, not a shock treatment, not, an over, not a real cut in the quantity of money, but to hold down and have a gradual reduction in the rate of monetary growth. Number three, you have to eliminate as many of the regulations that now bedevil the economy as you possibly can. The most important area there is the energy area. We have created the energy mess because of governmental intervention. The most effective measure we could take for both foreign policy and domestic policy would be to get rid of the Department of Energy, to get rid of this mislabeled windfall profits tax, to let the private enterprise economy go to work to produce the energy that we need. Now, on your last question, 
I do not believe it is either feasible or desirable to establish a gold standard under current circumstances. The gold standard served well in the 19th century. If you could restore the conditions of the 19th century, namely a situation in which federal government spending was 3% of national income, right. I'd be in favor of a gold standard. And some of your detractors would want you to know that the writings of your hero, Adam Smith, took place as well in the 19th century. No, no, our... it didn't in the 18th century. All right, then my point, then my point, is, even, my point is even more valid. How, if the gold standard is no longer applicable, given the modern nature of economics, how can we expect Adam Smith's writings to be? Well, the principles... Which are that, even older, as you call them. Uh, well, you know, the Bible is 2,000 years old, and I don't think you would say that the principles of the Bible are not applicable, but the way you apply them are different. The circumstances are different. Right. The principles of Adam Smith are just as applicable today, but they have to be applied differently because the circumstances are different. And those principles made sense of the gold standard in the 19th century and don't in the 20th. We'll talk later about the fairness of referring to the Bible when arguing with the president. <laughs> we'll be back in just <laughs> You want to get rid of the FCC too, huh? No, uh, sure, of course. Get rid of the Federal Communications of Commission? Course. If you can buy, if you, you would regulate, you, I mean, we've got to have some control over the airwaves. No. No, what I would do would be to have the Federal Communications Commission have a big auction at which they would auction off all the present television and radio licenses. And then only fat cats would own radio and television a stations, nonsense. which many up detractors say is the situation now. You, well, first place, there are many of them, and many people could come in and compete with them. Do only fat cats... You taught we were talking about airlines. Only fat cats own airlines? No, anybody here can buy a share of stock in the United Airlines or in TWA in the same way with... So they'd be publicly and held, stations. and stockholders could dissent if they didn't like the commercials, if the commercials were too loud. Well, they could sell if if they thought that the uh, that the company wa uh, the station wasn't doing a good job. They could sell their stock. Much more effective than voting in Washington, because each individual separately can decide what to do. But more important, if you once put it into made it into private property, it would be not subject to the fairness doctrine. You would have the same kind of free press on radio and television right, and that you now have in the newspapers. Are Look, you going to trust me to put all of the candidates on my program? Or am no. I just going to put my favorite You put your favorite on and some other station will put its favorite on. You do not get fairness by every individual program being fair. You do not get fairness by every individual station get fairness. In any event, I'm not in favor of fairness. I'm in favor of freedom. <laughs> And freedom is not fairness. Fairness means somebody has to decide what's fair. And that means the FCC people have to decide what's fair. And I don't want the FCC people to decide for me what I should listen to or hear. And you wouldn't be able, if the public at large didn't agree with your choices, you'd be out of business. Yeah, I would. So you, you, you know, it's a funny thing. People think that uh, it's the appearance of power versus the reality of power. It looks like as if you have a lot of power over what you put on your show. But you don't. Really? Because, <laughs> because if you didn't appeal to the public, if these people didn't like, you do a marvelous job. I'm not questioning that. But you do a marvelous job because you have found uh, an audience for your product. Uh, so in other words, my power comes from the people. Is your Absolutely. And if I just put on uh, all of my favorites, then the public will clearly see that Donnie, who was sold out in their, their eye. Look, I've been reading your book. It's a good book, and I recommend it to you just as he recommended mine. But in that book, you point out the difficulties you had getting into New York. Yes. Suppose you had had to have government permission to go into New York. Do you think you would have had it any easier? Do you think you could have had as much independence as you've had? Mm -hmm. and, and under the Friedman uh, laissez-faire uh, broadcasting system, there would have been more opportunities for this state from Dayton, Ohio, to there, get into New York. Absolutely. There would have been more stations. There more, would have been, instead of three big networks, you would have had a much broader group of stations. You would have been able to break in much sooner. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it would have happened. Uh, is, can we take one here? Oh, we got to be. Uh, is the caller there? Yes. Just hang on a second. I'm doing my best. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Milton Friedman is reachable via United States mail, government controlled as it is, and uh, <laughs> uh, at the Hoover Institution, uh, Stanford, uh, California, the zip there is 94305, okay? That's easy enough. 
in an age of bureaucratic numbers mumbo jumbo this is a rel relatively simple address let him know how you feel i know you're there caller at stanford california just one th i've got to get this in let's now one more time off the ivory tower your you your uh, statement against government growth and too much spending do i assume that you bring the same free to be irresponsible uh, statements against military spending well 140 I, billion dollars <laughs> You say 140 billion. Uh, 20, 15 years ago, military spending was over twice as much as the spending of HEW. Today, the spending of HEW is over twice as much as about uh, twice as much as military spending. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, before Vietnam, military spending was 9 percent of the national income. Today, it's between 4 and 5 percent. I said earlier the two basic functions of the government are to protect the nation against foreign enemies yes. and to protect the citizen against his fellows. Uh, military spending is essential for the first. Of course, if we could do it in a private enterprise way, it'd be a lot cheaper. Would you like to try? I have never been able to figure out a way to turn the military, sp uh, the defense of the country over to private enterprise. I'd give but, a prize to but, anybody who can figure out how to do it. Professor Friedman, there are, there are critics who say that it already is, and that the reason old men declare wars is because they have a financial investment in the companies that make bombs and bullets and guns and uniforms and all it takes to get the... Uh, I don't believe that for a moment. I don't doubt that the people who have those interests try to exert their influence in that way. But this is so serious and so important a matter that I really think it's, it's no a travesty one saying, on what's going on. No one is saying it's a conscious effort, no, no. But, but the but, fact but that the is profit the, is there has got to influence behavior. It's got you to. Mean that's End the, decision. You mean that's the reason why our military spending has gone down so sharply? Are you, 140 billion isn't enough for you? Do you know how much an aircraft carrier costs? I got this just today, this week from Senator Proxmire. Five billion for the boat and five billion for the planes on it. Ten billion for one boat. How do you feel about that? I think it's a, it's a lot too much and might, very likely, if you could ha turn that over to private enterprise, it would cost half as much. But we have to have a strong military and at the moment, let me get to this because I think it's very important. If this country is fundamentally threatened, in my opinion, it is m threatened much more by our weak position in foreign affairs than it is threatened by any mistakes that we have made in economic management. We can recover from the mistakes in economic management, but if we put ourselves in a position in foreign policy of the kind we've been putting ourselves in, we cannot recover. We're through. It's a that, one-time that's, off. That's directly and opposite the statements of many, many honorable, reasonable people who are saying, it's the cost of bacon and the fact that the middle class can't make it to the next paycheck and the fact that several thousand people in the automobile industry are out of work that's going to threaten the, the integrity and strength of this country, not a group of students somewhere in it's not. When you talk about a group of students, I'm not concerned about the group of students. I'm concerned about the Russian armies on both sides of that strait. I'm concerned about the fact that in our neglect we permitted the Russian to take over the base of Aden when the British left it in 1971 and they have built up a major military base with airplanes and so on, that they are now coming into Afghanistan. They've got both parts of the Persian right. Gulf in a pincers. All right. Oh, my, how unrealistic can you be not to look at what's been happening to the relative strength and position of the Russians on the one hand and of ourselves on the other? And do you think they're spending that money and devoting their energy to that in order to have it sit idle? All right, and what are you going to do with the workers who built all these airplanes after the order is canceled by the government? General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Boeing in Seattle. What are you, what is the economist going to do to help the economy, the local economy, when suddenly big daddy government cuts off the Not government? Not a thing. Not a thing. The, and there's no reason to do anything because all of those people and the people who bid in that included in their bids an allowance for the possibility and the danger that they would be cut off. And they will have to adjust just as all the other people have to adjust. What are you going to do for the people who are out of work when the public at large suddenly changes from wanting uh, one kind of pair of shoes to another kind of pair of shoes? What are you going to do when the public at large uh, decides it's, it's not going to go in big cars, it's going to go in little cars? I don't want to do a thing. I want to let the private market work. The private market system is a system of profit and loss. And the loss part is just as essential as the profit part. It is a disgrace that we should be bailing out Chrysler. Chrysler ought to be allowed to go broke. All right. I know. The caller is still there. All right. I'm going to try and get you on. I really am, and I'm sorry, but I have to break now. 
We'll be, I have to. In the free enterprise what system. What you call is a tease. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Hi, I'm glad you waited. Sorry, what? You had a question. Uh, yes. I would like to ask... Uh, what? Prof uh, Professor Freeman, what the average middle-income taxpayer can do to get uh, to quit being taken to the uh, cleaners by the IRS. <laughs> All right, just give us a... Unfortunately, unfortunately, very little. I do not believe that you can find a solution to that problem as individuals. I think we can find a solution to that problem as citizens. Thanks very much to Milton Friedman. <laughs> You're something. And Evan, I say, oh, free to choose the book. Don't forget the book. I'm happy to show off the book. Have a nice day, everybody.